now we are going to forget everything going on around the nucleus and concentrate in on the centre of every single atom. Now, there is some terminology that you're going to have to use. That this is a nucleus. But if I was talking about many of them, uh, I would describe them as nuclei. That is the plural for nucleus. The adjective to describe anything to do with the nucleus is nuclear. If I was to say that something uh, was associated with the nucleus, then it would be nuclear by description. Now be careful. The nucleus of an atom is different to the nucleus of a biological cell. It's different in scale and it's different in function. The nucleus of an atom is many, many millions of times smaller. It also does not control anything. It is simply a conglomeration of matter in the centre of the atom. If we were to describe what this nucleus was like, the only two bits of information, really, that I could gain from it are just the numbers of the protons and neutrons that are present. See here, I've got blue representing my neutrons, and I've got red representing my protons. There is a notation that enables us to write down what this nucleus is made of, and this is it. First of all, let's look at the X. What does the X mean? Well, that stands for, or is a stand-in, for the chemical symbol. So this was oxygen. So the X in this case would be the chemical symbol for oxygen, or O. So I would write this one, first of all, O. Now these two numbers, one represented by A and one represented by Z, they also have meaning. First of all, Z is the atomic number. The atomic number is the number of protons present in this nucleus, to which there is eight. So for this one, I'm going to put an eight at the bottom. A at the top is called the mass number, and that is equal to the total number of protons and neutrons just here. Now for this one, this is a rather unusual oxygen nucleus because it doesn't have eight neutrons like that which is most common. This one actually has nine. So with nine neutrons, it means the total number of particles in here is nine plus eight, which is 17. You might see a different isotope of oxygen represented with an 8 here and a 16 there. So remember, you can always find the mass number by taking the number of protons and adding it to the number of neutrons. It tells you the total mass of the nucleus, whereas the atomic number is just the number of protons. What you can see, if this is the number of both, and this is just the number of protons, that A minus Z will give us just the number of neutrons. And it'll help us to identify which isotope of this element we are dealing with. This nucleus of oxygen, this isotope, is unstable. You see, the normal isotope of oxygen has eight protons and eight neutrons, and they can fit together fairly symmetrically, which means all of the particles are as close together, snug, tucked in and stable, but the addition of one extra neutron leaves my nucleus really asymmetrical and it tries to push in and that pushes out something somewhere else and it is constantly moving, constantly trying to repack itself as close together as possible, very, very unstable. 
Now what can happen is, by chance, one of these reorganizations could accidentally, whoops, knock out one of the uh, particles in the nucleus. Now this has pushed out a neutron. And indeed a neutron can get pushed out, it's how Chadwick discovered the neutron in the first place. But we're going to look at the more exotic things that can get pushed out of a nucleus in this video. Here's some terminology. Before, I had a stable isotope. Having one extra neutron on board made it an unstable isotope. The process by which it became stable was called a nuclear decay. A nucleus will decay if the products are more stable than what there was before. A common decay that can occur is this one. When a chunk of nucleus flies off like this. Now in reality, these types of decays occur off much bigger nuclei than an oxygen isotope. So these sorts of decays occur off things like uranium. But here we can see that something unusual has broken off. It is two protons and two neutrons. This looks just like a helium nucleus. So if you consider that helium is two protons, two neutrons and two electrons around the outside, well, ignoring the electrons, this looks just like helium. Now helium is a very stable nucleus and that's why it has broken off in one piece and has now been ejected from this nucleus. Now interestingly what happens when it does detach is the sticky force of attraction between the neutrons is lost and then suddenly they're no longer stuck together the repulsion between the positive charges of the nucleus, uh, of the protons in the nucleus, pushes this away at high speed. This is called an alpha particle. And the alpha particles used in Rutherford's scattering experiment were just like this. These, ejected from the decaying nucleus, really fast and fly out, leaving the nucleus two protons less, two neutrons less, and a lot more stable. So here it is, the alpha particle. The alpha particle was one of the very first types of radiation discovered, and subsequent discovered types of radiation were named after the Greek alphabet, alpha, beta, gamma, and so on. And because of that, we can use the Greek symbol for the word alpha to represent the alpha particle. The Greek symbol for alpha looks like this. Now what we can use is the notation developed here on our alpha particle to describe what's in it. First of all, how many protons does it have? It has two. That means it must have a 2 down here in the atomic number place. It has two protons, two neutrons, which means in total it has four particles all together. And so the mass number is 4. 4 times the mass of a single proton. And this leads to certain properties that I want to just make really clear. The first, and I could use a different colour, is, if we look, it has a mass of 4. This we could describe as a high mass. Compared to other particles, the alpha particle has loads of mass. It also has a strong, it has a large positive charge. A charge twice 
as much as a single proton. That makes the alpha particle a bit of a bully. To understand what alpha particles are like, we need to do an investigation where we detect them. This is the equipment we would need to detect an alpha particle. It is a Geiger-Muller tube, sometimes known as a Geiger counter. This device is counting how many times an alpha particle, or something similar, strikes the end of the tube. And what you can see while we sit here is that it is counting incidents of radiation hitting the tube all the time. That's before the alpha particle source is brought into the room. This radiation is the background radiation, and there'll be a different video on that. What we must do is we must account for the background radiation before we even start to think about what the alpha particle is doing. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to time for one minute and see how many instances of radiation there were within that one minute. So let's give it a go. I'll we'll start my stopwatch and reset the clock. Three, two, one. And off they go. There we had 24 instances of radiation in the 60 seconds. The activity, 24 divided by 60, gives how many instances of radiation were detected every single second. 0.4 were detected every second, which means I would really expect to have one every two and a bit seconds. This activity of 0.4, we can give a new unit for. The amount of uh, instances of radiation detected per second, we describe it as a BQ, or a Becquerel, after Henri Becquerel, who discovered radiation. This measurement of activity from the background we must subtract from any readings when dealing with radiation. If you're ever asked a question asking how you would measure the amount of radioactivity you must always first do a background count and subtract it afterwards. Ready to show you now this. This here is an alpha source. It is kept inside this giant metal block. This, unscrewing it, on the very end of this contains the, um, the unstable isotope. So in the case of this, a nucleus that was unstable, it is present here. Now I can point at the camera quite safely uh, you can just about see the radioactive material in the end of this. What is being given out from this end are invisible alpha particles flying over here. What you'll notice is that when we bring it close to the Geiger counter, we should detect lots more radiation. But how much? Well, let's do this as a controlled experiment. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold this at two centimeters away and I'm going to count for one whole minute to see how much radiation I detect in that time. So let's bring it into two centimeters away, which is there, and I'm going to reset the clock and press start. And here, one minute is coming now. 2,335 counts. So, my alpha count was 2337. And that was in the space of one minute. So, because my time interval is 60 seconds, then I know the activity at 2 centimetres is equal to 2337 
divided by 60. So the activity I'm getting here is 38.95 BQ. Now, a really important thing to remember is what we've just measured there was not just the radioactivity coming from the alpha source, but also from the background. So we must, to get the activity of the alpha source by itself, we must subtract the background value. So the activity of the alpha is going to be 38.95 minus 0.4. And you can see that that really doesn't make very much difference at all. We've got 38.55 becquerel. If you were to measure the rate, you would do it like this. You would make sure that you first take a measurement of the background radiation, then measure with your sample, and then subtract the activity of the background from the activity of your sample plus background. This will give you the activity of your sample by itself. Now we don't always need to measure the actual number of counts per second. Sometimes we can get a qualitative feel for how much radiation is present just by looking at how quickly this number goes up. What you will notice is the following thing. If I start my alpha source at 20 centimetres away, you can see that just there is a slightly greater range of radiation now hitting the detector. And as I bring it closer along that scale, you will suddenly see at about here, at about six centimetres that we're suddenly getting far more. Now some of those earlier detections may not have actually been alpha particles but may have been other particles being given off by this source. But what is really clear at about six centimetres is that we are now within range of the alpha particles. We're definitely detecting them. As I move closer you can see that the rate increases, far more of the alpha particles are getting to my Geiger counter and then you can see, as we close it down to zero centimetres, all of the alpha particles are reaching the detector. So why is this? What's going on that limits the range of the alpha particles? Well, being big, heavy uh, particles like this, they are flying through the air and encountering air molecules. When they do so, they hit the air molecules and quite often get slowed down, capturing electrons as they go. All of the energy that they had as they were flying along, their kinetic energy is suddenly absorbed in that collision. And so the alpha particles travel no further and just become helium that just then drift away and are not detected by this detector. So it is the air that is getting in the way. On this source, you can see you can see that it actually says uh, a and the greek symbol for gamma so this source is actually giving off two types of radiation alpha and gamma but what we're going to do now is we're going to measure over one minute with some paper between the detector and the source so here we go we'll reset reset this stopwatch. We need to do it at two centimetres again. We'll reset our counter and we'll start two centimetres and count for a minute. So there I have alpha plus paper. The count rate was equal to 1.614 in 60 seconds. So what I can do here is have a look now. 1614 divided by 60 gives a activity of 26.9 becquerel. 
which I must subtract 0 0.4 from the background level to find out what it is, minus 0 0.4. So I've now got an activity of 26.5 Becquerel. What you can see is we kept the distance the same. It was the same alpha source. We treated the background radiation exactly the same. The only thing that changed is we put some paper in. The presence of the paper has significantly decreased the activity, meaning that paper actively stops alpha particles. The reason why this hasn't gone to zero, the fact that there is still some activity being detected, is because our alpha source is also giving off some gamma rays, which we will talk about later. One final thing to note about alpha particles is that if we place a sheet of aluminium, it massively cuts down on the number of alpha particles. In fact, the aluminium will completely block and absorb all of the alpha particles. It is only gamma rays getting through. Something that will do it to a greater extent is lead. Lead will block alpha particles very easily indeed. The ability to penetrate through material, to penetrate through the air, through the paper, through the aluminium, through the lead, is something that we round up and describe as the penetrative properties of that kind of nuclear radiation. So here, alpha particles are not very penetrative at all. They are stopped by a few centimetres of air, which we found out to be about six centimetres. They are also stopped by paper and anything thicker than that. Now, it's not to say that alpha particles are only stopped by paper. It is that even paper can stop it, and everything thicker than paper will also stop it. Some people think when they see alpha particles and they are stopped so easily that they are not dangerous. But actually, it turns out that alpha particles are very dangerous, especially if they are ingested, if they get inside our bodies. But more about that later. Another type of radiation that can be given off by the nucleus is one of these, a speedy little guy called a beta particle. Now, a beta particle is an interesting little chap because it is a fast-moving electron. So, what exactly is it? It's a fast-moving electron. Which is going to cause confusion, but more about that shortly. We can express it with our notation. We use the Greek symbol beta to represent it. Now, what is going on in terms of the mass number and the atomic number? Well, first of all, electrons don't have mass of the same kind of magnitude as a proton or a neutron. They have about two thousandth of the mass. But in all intents and purposes, that is approximately zero. So we're going to say that it has very little mass. And we're going to represent it as zero, not quite zero, but near enough zero. How many protons does it have? What is its atomic number? Well, now here is one small caveat of the atomic number. It doesn't actually count protons. It counts the amount of charge present. So if there are six protons, then there is also plus six charge. So this number down at the bottom actually is a measurement of charge. Here, an electron does not have any positive charge, it has negative one charge, because it has as much charge as a proton, but negative. So it has a minus one down on this bottom line. And this leads to certain things. How would we describe? We describe it as having a low mass and a smaller 
and negative charge. These differences are going to result in beta particles behaving differently to alpha particles. Let's go have a look. Our beta source is kept in this small wooden box and we try to be fairly quick about handling it. Inside the wooden box is a little lead tub and we're going to handle the beta source with tongs. The reason why is going to become very obvious. Perfect. The beta source there, I'm being careful not to point at myself for obvious reasons. What you'll see as I bring it close is that it is indeed being detected by the Geiger counter. But what you should notice is that it actually has a much greater range than the alpha particle source. It can still hit the Geiger counter at over 20 centimetres away. Furthermore, putting a piece of paper in doesn't stop these beta particles. Putting in a sheet of aluminium pretty much does. And just for completeness, the lead completely blocks the beta particles. So how would I describe the penetrative properties of the beta particle? Well, compared to the alpha, they are definitely more penetrating. It has stronger penetrative powers. It is not stopped by the air. It's not stopped by paper. But it is stopped by aluminium and anything thicker, including lead. So stopped by a few millimetres of aluminium. There we go. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, how can an electron come out of the nucleus? The electrons were around the outside of the nucleus. There's no business for an electron to be in the nucleus. But actually something happens. You don't know, need to know the details of it right now. But one of the neutrons is unhappy. And what happens is, it transitions into becoming a proton. But in order to become more positively charged, it has to get rid of some negative charge that it had stored within it. And the neutron is perfectly balanced. Getting rid of negative will make it positive. Getting rid of that negative is in the form of an electron that flies out of the nucleus. Now these electrons are different from the electrons we have in wires, and that cause thermal conduction, these electrons are super fast. And because of their fastness, they can actually cause damage when they hit things. Throwing overboard an alpha particle or having one of your neutrons turn into a proton is quite hard work. There might be an easier way for your nucleus to become more stable. It could give off some energy without changing any of the protons and neutrons within the nucleus. That energy would be given off in the form of electromagnetic radiation. Very high energy electromagnetic radiation in the form of a gamma ray. So here, it is a gamma ray. Notice that the alpha and the beta are particles and the gamma ray is actually a massless ray of high energy EM radiation. Because of that, it means that I could still write it out using the symbol, the Greek symbol for a gamma, which looks like a fish pointing down. It has zero mass and it has zero charge. Zero and zero. So let's take a look at the properties of gamma radiation. Gamma. Right, now I'm just going to move this slightly because I don't want to point this at myself particularly. Keep my ruler there, it's a nice, so we can compare to last time. I've got my paper, aluminium, lead and some even thicker lead here. And I'm going to be very careful not to touch this too closely. So 
As before, the sample is kept in a wooden box, and inside the wooden box, there is this. I'm going to do this as quickly as I can because I don't want to hang around. Pick up the sample, and make sure I do not point it at myself. I can show you, that's what it looks like, but I'm not going to point it at me. What you can see, pointing at the Geiger counter, is that it again doesn't really matter how close it is. It is, it is still picking up gamma radiation at almost any distance. It is, of course, uh, picking up far more close by simply because all of it is now going into this aperture, whereas back here, only a small fraction of it has been hitting that area. In terms of things that will stop it, paper does not stop it at all. Aluminium also does not stop the gamma rays. What about lead? It only stops it a small amount. I want a thicker sample of lead, which may be so thick I might not be able to hold it with my tweezers, but I'll give it a go. It, you, you can see it stopped some, but not all. I'll pop that away as quick as possible for safety. Things to note, it has no mass because it is light and it has no charge. And it is for these reasons that it is so penetrative. It is the most penetrating It will only be stopped by several meters of lead or concrete or something like that, something high density. Now, why is it that this can get through materials that look solid and not transparent to us. How can they pass straight through? It's basically because they have no mass and no charge. They're very unlikely to interact with matter, and so we'll go straight through it. It actually makes these kind of safer, because the radiation that I was exposed to from that radioactive source was going straight through my body and out the other side without actually depositing any energy. The alpha particle carrying mass and charge was going in there and it was being stopped by the atoms of my body and depositing all the energy instead. That means that the alpha particles, if they get inside you, are really dangerous because all of the energy that they carry is going straight into your cells. We'll talk more about the dangers of radiation later, but a key thing to realise is penetration does not necessarily mean damaging to you. Actually, it's kind of reverse. One way to think about it is like the jungle. The alpha particle is like the elephant, the beta particle is like the jaguar, and the gamma ray is like the hummingbird. The hummingbird can go straight through the jungle and out the other side without causing any damage whatsoever. The alpha particle can't get through the first row of trees without snapping branches and causing a whole load of damage. It is because it is so damaging that it is least penetrating. 